Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to Chattering with Nicholas Vince. Uh, in a few moments, I'm going to introduce Keith introduce Keith Robson. Um, and we're going to talk about the Kickstarter for his short film Creek and his Hidden Horrors Feast and Train to Busan. But before I do that, I just wanted to thank everybody who's subscribed. Um, we're still getting subscribers each week. That's great. And likes on the Facebook page. Um, so that's really useful as well because it helps spread because you can share posts to the Facebook page. So if you are watching it and if you see a guest that you want you know, to promote or you've seen a show that you'd like to promote, you can share links from the Facebook page. Um, uh, chattering with Nicholas Vince. Okay, cool. Hi, Keith. Hello, Nicholas. <laughs> Hello. Thank you very much for having me on. That's my pleasure. And I bet you've been enjoying this lovely sunshine today, have you? Uh, yes, it's not been as hot here as it has been with you, but uh, nonetheless, beautiful day. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's been it's been like this for, we're just waiting for rain, really. I think we had a little, a few scatters of rain uh, the other day, but apart from that, it's just been, this is one of the reasons my voice is so croaky, because the air is so dry. Um, anyway, let's ignore all that. We've been, we've done the British thing, we've discussed the weather. Um, <laughs> what, what, tell us a little bit about Creek, about your short film Creek, please. Okay, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, I guess it's a, it's a creature feature romp. So uh, it's a short and we have very limited time as to how much we can uh, squeeze into that, that period of time. And the, the fundamental goal from the start really was to make a, a monster movie that focuses purely on that element, uh, the monster, the practical effects side of it. And um, just something that would be really good fun um, and you know, ignoring kind of boring dialogue and you know all, all that sort of thing that people don't really want to see with a with a film like this. So, right, right. What what was your inspiration? What, what what were you thinking of when the idea first came to mind? Well, I mean, originally I can go back about maybe three and a half years. Um, a good friend of mine put a, a drawing online, some sort of concept art, and um, it was basically just a, a sort of set in the kind of 50s or, or that kind of era of you know, Hollywood's golden age of horror with a, a sort of screen queen in the foreground hiding behind the tree and the silhouette in the background of this sort of kind of towering uh, creature and uh, I thought it was really cool and it kind of occurred to me at the time that nothing really since um, Creature from the Black Lagoon which was uh, 1954 nothing really has been done um, in, in that kind of premise very simple just set in a swamp or in a lake and there's a, a horrible beastie trying to attack people. So um, it started off with a piece of concept art, basically, uh, and then with a, a mixture of a good location that was found just by chance and uh, getting started on sculpting a, a monster mask. That's really how it all started. Right, so w w what is the location? Whereabouts will you be filming as long as people... So this is down, uh, actually not too far from where I live, which is very fortunate. Um, down at a sort of nature reserve um, in Scotland, a place called Tents Muir, um, just a very vast, expansive uh, forest which actually has a loch or, or three individual lochs um, situated right in the middle of it. So um, yeah, when I, when I saw the location, I thought this is just perfect for a, a monster movie, for a creature feature. Okay, cool. Sorry, I was just trying to see if I could get a better sound on my headphones, and of course my headphones have just decided to lose lose you entirely. So bear with me for just two seconds. Uh, default speakers, built-in output. Right, yeah, we'll carry. So you've got this wonderful um, uh, location. How long did it take you to build the makeup and the costume? Uh, about 18 hours. So all in all, um, the original sculpt, which was just done in water-based clay, uh, took about three and a half or four months to do, um, which is a lot longer than what people usually spend doing something like that, but uh, it was the very first time I'd ever tried. So um, it, it just started off as a mask, uh, and then um, it was Laurie, uh, a good friend Laurie Brewster from Hex Media, uh, saw the, the progress of, of this mask, and uh, suggested that um, we should do something with it in a, in a short film. 
Uh, that coincided basically with the anthology, which we can talk about a bit later. Um, but yeah, basically it started with a mask and uh, I, I just started to literally add the arms and legs to it as I, as I went on. I see. Now you've done creature work before because you were mentioning Laurie Brewster. Perhaps it's worth just reminding people what creature work you've done before. Yeah. So um, Laurie uh, is the uh, as the, the brain behind Hex Media or Hex Studios, uh, and he's done um, a lot of films recently. The uh, well, basically kind of got recognition with Lord of Tears originally with the Yellow Man, which I think people um, will identify with most. Uh, I got brought on board uh, just really as a runner and someone to help out on the unkindness of ravens, um, and then in true Laurie fashion, got roped into uh, to helping out with a little bit more than that. So I um, got to don the raven outfit and the, the masks and things, and, and had experience with doing the, the sort of creature performing, I guess, in in that movie. Um, so that was great fun. I mean, I absolutely loved, loved doing it. Um, the next film after that was the the black gloves, of course, which you'll know. Yeah, uh, you, uh, you were featured in, in that. So um, yeah, with that as well, with the old man um, coming back in again, uh, again, just I, I, what a privilege to to don the the costume of of the old man because he's he's just so popular and uh, people tend to love him. So uh, so it was it was difficult to to coordinate myself into what had already been presented in Lord of Tears uh, with uh, with the other old man. So. Um, so I found that quite a challenge to, to get into that character after doing Ravens. So um, uh, I'm it, it the who, who played Owl Man in, in um, uh, Lord of Tears? No, I don't know if I'm actually <laughs> allowed oh, to right, okay. if that's just the old man. But I but certainly give full credit afterwards if, uh, if I'm allowed to say, but I'm not sure if that's been credited or not. So. Right, right. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to double check with Craig. I'm getting some, some echoing of my voice. Um, right, I'll try to turn the volume down at this end and see if that Yeah, echo echoing of my voice. Uh, it seems to have disappeared again. It, it sometimes drops in and out, and it's never quite explained why it does it. Sorry about that. It's like technical issues uh, this week, folks. Um, so how did you meet Laurie? How did you meet Laurie Brewster? So, um, Gavin Robertson, who you've had on your show before to mm -hmm. talk about Hitchcock, um, Wendigo, which was uh, back in March, he did a crowdfunder for that. Um, Gavin and I have been basically best friends since we were born. Um, we were neighbours uh, in, in our little village. And uh, yeah, we've been best friends ever since. So Gavin got involved with Laurie um, before Lord of the Tears. They met at high school um, and went to college together. Um, so they, they were doing Lord of Tears, that was finished, and they'd already started filming Ravens. Um, and then they had to have a break, I think, um, over the over the winter. Um, so they returned to Ravens a year later, and Gavin just asked me along to, to help out, as I said, as, as a runner. Um, someone to just kind of help out behind the scenes with the crew. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that was my first taste of, of the industry. And um, at that, that time of Ravens, this was pretty much the last act of the movie when all hell breaks loose. So lots of blood and guts, lots of practical effects and lots of action. So I just absolutely loved it. Um, you know, one of the, the, the best times I've ever had uh, on that shoot. So, um, so yeah, I, I was just hooked. And um, uh, Laurie and I became close uh, during, during the filming of Ravens and have fortunately been invited back ever since. Brilliant. Okay, cool. So going back to Creek um, for uh, a little while. Um, congratulations on hitting the target on the Kickstarter. How many? How long has the Kickstarter got left to run? So it finishes on Thursday evening. I think ten o'clock uh, UK time on Thursday. So all, the best part of five days uh, left still to go. Um, so it's, we did really well. We hit the the target at the end of last week I think and um, just after a last kind of promotional push uh, so now we're at the stage of being on to our um, our stretch goals for the for the campaign right so please talk me through the stretch goals what stretch because you're near you're nearly at your first stretch goal is that right yeah so we're, we're only we're less than a hundred pounds away from our first stretch goal 
which is going to focus on adding more and fine-tuning the practical effects that we have in the film already. So, um, you know, buying these uh, practical effects prosthetics and making them, uh, which I'll be doing myself, you know, it does cost money, unfortunately. So we were a bit limited with budget um, originally, but uh, the idea is to go back to what we've shot already and get some additional footage with some, uh, some extra gory body practical effects and throw them uh, into the mix. So that's, that's the aim of our first stretch goal. And right. Increasing the production value of what we already have uh, by just going back and spending a little bit more time uh, on, our, on our more bloody scenes. Right. And, um, um, yeah, I, there's nothing I can do about me echoing. It'll just come and go. Um, the, uh, then the next stretch goal, we were, you were talking to me about a little bit earlier on. Um, now, I'm sure I've seen photographs of you being suspended from a tree. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> difficult, difficult not to give too much away, but uh, the the script for Crete was, was very ambitious from the start. I thought that was very evident that I had all these um, these grand plans and, and visions in my head of, of things that I wanted to happen. And I guess it wasn't until we started shooting and I kind of realized, started to realize how difficult these things would actually be to do, uh, not to mention dangerous. So um, yeah, we this uh, the second stretch goal is basically to go back again and, and revisit a scene that I really wanted in the film, um, which we've tried so hard uh, to actually do already, but unfortunately it just I mean it, it didn't it didn't work out. It looked awful by the time we were finished because it was all a bit haphazard and uh, you know a bit a bit risky and dangerous. So um, the, the plan is if we, if we reach this second stretch goal is basically to invest in the equipment that we really need to make it, to do it safely and to do it properly and, and have what I think will be quite a, a key uh, scene that will you know, get a, a little bit of a cheer or certainly a big smile from, from the audience uh, if we manage to get that in the film. So um, it's, it's something, it's, it's a personal stretch goal for me because I was just quite, uh, you know, Quite frustrated at the fact that we tried so hard and it, it just didn't work out. So I'd love to be able to to get that. Right, right, okay. So the link to the Kickstarter is on the YouTube video and the description of the, the YouTube video. So if you want to check out the campaign and support Keith, <laughs> apparently see him flying in some <laughs> manner of manner of form safely. We hasten to add. Um, that, yeah, you, you please go, do go and check it out. Um, what now i've got a couple of questions and a couple of comments come in whilst you've been talking this is from alan mcneil for keith i was at i was at edinburgh horicon and for the two days i was racking my brain trying to figure out what movie your costume came from kudos you had me completely stumped <laughs> <laughs> so that's a real mark of it thank you thank you um and this is a, a question from kim layman hi kim um keith and, and hi, Alan, as well, come to think of it. Keith, were you inspired by such special effects artists such as Rob Bettine, Tom Savini, and Rick Baker? Let me rephrase that question slightly, Kim. Do you have a particular makeup artist that you particularly admire, or a particular film where you know, that you admire for the special, the, uh, special makeup effects? Sure. There's, I mean, there's, there's so many, um, you know, in, in the industry now, and, and they, they do actually nowadays, and rightly so, get a lot of, of recognition for their work now, um, which I think maybe back in the, the late 80s and 90s, you know, people tend not to know who it was that, that did the effects. Um, so I, I got into horror very, very young, you know, probably way before I should have. Uh, so I was watching, I was right in the height of the, the slasher franchises being at their peak. So Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the Thirteenth, uh, Halloween movies like that were uh, were all you know on the top shelf at the, the video store. Um, so Tom Savini was again he was showcasing a lot of his work in that that period of the late eighties, early nineties. So I guess my introduction to to practical effects would probably be um, through him more so than anyone else. Um, he he just seemed to be working on everything, Creep Show, Friday the Thirteenth. Uh, movies like that. So, um, so I, I still to this day love his work. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, more recently, I guess uh, through Laurie and through Gavin, 
um, Amalgamated Designs or Studio ADI uh, out in LA. Um, I follow them very closely and a huge fan of all the, the movies that they've been involved with. Um, and I think they're, they're creatures and they're, they're practical monsters that they make for their movies are just unbelievable. The, the amount of work that, they, that goes into them, the puppetry and animatronics um, as well is, is really just absolutely breathtaking. So, uh, I mean, great examples of that are like Starship Troopers, which even to this day holds up very, very well um, as well. And he did the, uh, the practical effects on the remake of John Carpenter's The Thing. Uh, but unfortunately, that was all painted over digitally, which was a you know, huge sore spot for the, the horror community. But, uh, but regardless, I, I follow them, um, you know, almost daily, keeping up to date with what they're doing. That's uh, Tom Woodruff Jr., who, um, who played Pumpkinhead as well as uh, him and his partner, Alec Gillis. They made the, the Pumpkinhead costume through the studio. So, I mean, I, I just love everything that they do. Can't, uh, can't praise them enough. Right, yeah, I, I'd seen the um, uh, YouTube video of the original practical effects for the thing. Yes. And um, it is quite ex extraordinary. And it's just so much more effective than the CGI stuff. Absolutely, yeah. Because it's just, it looks more real. Mm -hmm. It just looks more real. So basically, they, you know, they did all those practical stuff. And then somebody said, yeah, you know what? Let's spend a shed load more money yeah. with CBI, CGI because I don't know why, perhaps because they thought that's what the kids would like. Um, and that they don't, you know, kids don't like practical yeah. effects. Well, that's not, that can't possibly be true. Yeah. Otherwise I wouldn't keep on meeting young people when they come to conventions, um, you know, huge fan, fans of Hellraiser. Yeah. So it makes no sense to me why, you know. Well, it's in interviews with uh, Alex and, uh, Alex, sorry, and Tom, um, speaking about that particularly, and you know, it's a, it's a sore spot for them um, because they put so much work into it. And I think the the idea was when the, the movie was ongoing as though it would have digital polishing to so still using the practical effects, but you know, getting rid of the, the, the wires and yeah. things like that. Um, but yeah, they, they didn't really find out until the very last minute, um, actually until it was almost released that everything that they'd done really had just been removed. Um, but the, the producers or the, or the studio of the film um, had basically said that they wanted it to move, uh, look more like a video game for their, their target audience, which I just think is, you know, I, I don't understand at all. So uh, very, very unfortunate, but, uh, but regardless, the, the, there's countless examples of, of their work uh, at ADI, which is, you know, as I say, uh, even the older stuff holds up you know, amazing to this day. So uh, great, great follower of, of them. Um, okay, um, but sorry, I'm just reading something. Uh, okay, Uber cosplay was it Frightmare this year? Do you remember? Okay, cool. Um, right, so, um, what is I going to say? Right, I will. Craig, I'll deal with that. I'm going to respond to that message in a moment. Actually, this is a general thing. If you want, somebody's asking how to contact me. Um, I think it's how to con contact. Yes, I was at Frightmare. Hi, Reaper. If you want to contact me, if you want, if you go to, uh, unless it's just chitty chatty, or if it's about business or something, um, if you go either, if it's kind of a social thing that you want to contact me, just message me through Facebook. Uh, if it's work related then the best way to get in touch with me is through www.nicholasvents forward slash contact uh, so if it's work related go to the website if it's just a social thing then just message me via facebook i do respond to all messages when i see them um right cool all right so yeah well good luck with that um it's the uh you know the um the, the creep a creek uh, kickstarter um because it really does look a lot, and this is an incredibly effective costume. It really is. <laughs> and I did admire you for walking around Edinburgh HorrorCon in two, for two yeah. days. That was hard work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, yeah, that was very, very hard work. Um, and yeah, <laughs> incredibly effective, incredibly effective. We, we, cool. started, uh, we started, or we, we basically built our original following um, around and from the guys at Edinburgh HorrorCon. So just thank you all to, to everybody that chased up all the 
promotional flyers that we were handing out and it stopped us to ask questions about it as well. It was just, we wouldn't have been able to, to have such a following if they hadn't uh, started it for us. So thank you so much for everybody. Yeah, I think more and more these days, cosplay is becoming a real feature of horror conventions. Uh, when I first started, it really wasn't. It was, you know, it was fairly unusual to see cosplay happening. But now it's it's, it's a huge part of, uh, of of horror conventions. You know, from my perspective, in terms of the number of people I see walking up to the table in costume, um, I've had a couple of chatterers walk up to the table. <laughs> <laughs> Which is lovely. I, you know, I really admire people uh, who, who do that. Cool. All right. So I'm just going to give the usual spoiler alert uh, because we're going to move on to. Um, oh, actually, it's not sorry. I did, what I didn't do before we move on is to talk about the rewards. What sort of rewards can people get for the Kickstarter on Creek? Right. So, um, I mean, having a, a good look around Kickstarter before I started the, the campaign, just to, just to get an idea of, of what sort of things in, in the, the horror Kickstarters people tend to like uh, pledging on, had a good look around. But again, I went to Laurie and his Kickstarters, which he's done for, um, for Ravens, for the Black Gloves, and recently for Automata. Um, and his Kickstarters always look beautiful, the way that they're structured and, and laid out. So, um, so there was a bit of copy and pasting going on, I'll, I'll admit, but it's a, a, a tried and tested method, which, uh, which looked really good. So, um, but the rewards, uh, again, successful rewards, like could be t-shirts and artwork and, and things like that. So it started simple, you can have the, the digital downloads of the movie um, and a little bit more of an extensive packet than that would be behind the scenes content and um, concept artwork and, and things added on top of that too. Um, we've had a few people work on our T-shirts uh, designs as well. So there's four, four um, good designs for kind of official Creek T-shirts you can get as well. Um, and then something that I thought would be quite lucrative to um, to folk that want to maybe advance their their knowledge in practical effects was to make just a little documentary about how I made the creature from scratch. So this is this is going into quite a lot of detail through every stage of of the process, making the mask, making the suit. Uh, and things, and that will revolve around a, a tutorial, basically, of, of painting a blank creature mask. So it'll just give folk an idea of, of the work that's gone into it, and you know, if, if they want to get involved themselves or give it a go, which I would completely suggest, then um, then yeah, that, that's great for people that, that are interested in that side of, of the filmmaking, really. Um, and then with that, our, our top end reward, basically, is the actual screen news masks themselves. So uh, we're once we're done with the, the movie, uh, then we, we've got our, our collection of our sort of official movie props, which um, one of them is actually here to say hello. Oh! <laughs> so this is our, uh, our creaker, as he's getting, getting uh, referred to more and more often now. So it's, these, these are pretty much the, the ones that were used in the film, and they'll be available basically through the Kickstarter to buy if people want to buy them. Um, and with that, you get a certificate of authenticity um, from myself, you know, saying that it was part of the Creek movie uh, and whatnot as well. So um, just for, for people that, that like that side of it, it's, it's a, I think it's a good collector's item and something that you can kind of put on the mantelpiece and will certainly start a conversation with, uh, with people coming to the house. So I thought that would be a great reward. Uh, top end, but, you know, these, they're limited and they, they won't be any more again. So. Cool. Um Right, so um, the, 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 I mean that's amazing, and I was just thinking, you know, if anybody wanted to go to a Halloween, uh, you know, rent a costume for Halloween, there is a mask that nobody else is. It's really unlikely, unless they happen to be massive Creek supporters as well. That you're going, <laughs> you're in the same family supporting the Kickstarter, possibly. Um, but uh, you know, there's a that's going to be a totally unique mask that you're going to be able to wear to your next Halloween bash. Sure. Um, we have a question uh, come in from uh, 1984 Raza is all I've got in front of me. And it's a really good question. I like this question. If Creek was to be updated from a short film to a full film in the future, would it be an exact remake or would it be a different film? I guess, I mean, you know, remaking a short film as a long film, that would just stretch. So I think, you know, would you tell the same story over 90 minutes or is would this be like a chapter in a much longer film? 
Right, okay, yeah, that, that is a good question. Um, I guess first and foremost, the, the shot itself is a, is a showcase, basically, is, is, is what that is. Um, showing off the monster and showing off the, the talent behind the crew, that involves you know, the cinematography and, and things like that. But you know, as I say, people want to see a monster movie, so that's what I'm trying to do in, in the short film. Um, with a feature, I, you know, I love the idea of uh, evolving a story, having a mythos, behind the creature and, and really delving into that. So it would be something, the story would be something very important um, into any possibility with the feature. Um, but even whilst I was still making the, the costume, Laurie and I have, um, have had a lot of discussions just about how cool the, the prospect of that would be. So um, it's, it's something that we'll definitely talk about together uh, and certainly exclusively with, with Laurie as well. Um, about developing the, the story at some point down the line. But um, yeah, I mean, I would absolutely love love the opportunity to, to do that. Um, but again, with using Laurie's films as an example, they, they put a huge amount of time and effort into the, the story element um, to, to, you know, to really get hold of the audience. So they, they've got great antagonists, they've got the, the superb cast that they always use, and their monsters are, are terrifying, but they use them very, very well. Uh, which revolve around a great story that, that kind of resonates you know, on a kind of psychological level as well. So I'd, I'd like to maintain a lot of the, the fun elements of the, of the creature feature um, that I have with the short, but at the same time, yeah, I'd, I'd love to get into like an origin story or, or build some kind of a mythos behind it. Um, possibly set, um, you know, maybe either in the 70s to kind of pay tribute to those lovely B-movies that, uh, that are still great to watch now. Um, or, or maybe even way before that, maybe even set hundreds of years ago. Um, you know, it'd be great to play around with, with ideas. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay, cool. All right. So let's move on from Creek and uh, we'll talk about your first hidden horror. Um, and again, just a reminder, spoiler alert, we may give away plot points if you, you know, We'll do our best not to ruin it for anybody who hasn't seen it at all, but inevitably, you know, stuff might slip through. So I will give you a warning. So the first one um, I'm, is oh. a film I had not, I'd not seen. I don't think I'd really heard of it um, before, and that is Feast. When did you first come across Feast? Uh, I think I've been racking my brain trying to think how I found it, and I think it was basically just in. HMV in the video store. I picked up the box and the cover art, which is the, the same as the poster, which you, you posted um, on the on the thread earlier. Uh -huh. As soon as you see that cover, you're like, you know, I, this is something I need to see. It's all monster, all teeth. And uh, yeah, that, that was enough for me. I'd, I'd never heard of it before. Um, and I think that it sold it for me there and then, and I, I picked it up and um, yeah. <laughs> like, how could you put that down after seeing the the cover, so I'm really glad that I did. <laughs> it's like, speaking of the creature and the cover, um, it's Gary Tunnicliffe who actually plays either Mama or Papa Monster. And of course, Gary is the makeup artist who did Pinhead for a long time, yes. wrote and directed the last two Hellraiser movies, um, certainly wrote and directed a Judgment uh, with Paul Taylor. Um, in it um so yeah it's like oh yeah okay it's nice to see you know, come across gary's work again um for those who've not seen feast um can you kind of again we're trying to avoid spoilers but just kind of explain what the, st the film is about a little please yeah sure um I, well it's a creature feature for sure a monster movie and it basically revolves around a, a group of um, people in a bar that you get the impression they've, they've all been there, they all know each other for a long, long time. It's the, the bar flies uh, in this middle of nowhere bar and all of a sudden all hell breaks loose and rains upon them in this bar and kind of, I guess, for the, for the following 80 or 85 minutes, just all hell breaks loose while these, these people try to survive the night. It, I, I, one of the things I found particularly fascinating is that it's directed by Clue Gallagher. And immediately I saw that, that name and I thought, hmm, I wonder if he's any relation to Clue Gallagher. And of course, it's Clue Gallagher's son. Yeah. And now Clue Gallagher, for people of my generation, was in The Virginian. 
uh, a TV series uh, from the 1960s. Um, and I noticed that basically uh, John Gallagher had cast both his father and his wife, I think they're married, um, in the movie and, and in the sequel as oh. well. Yes. <laughs> in fact, somebody mentioned on one of the comments earlier on that this is a part of a trilogy. I only had a chance to see the first oh. one. <laughs> Um, but they're, 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 they're great. They're really, really, uh, it's a really interesting movie. What I, you know, I titled it, let's kill that trope. Um, <laughs> because it really does take, you get all these lovely subtitles. Every time a character is introduced, um, you know, the fun fact, how likely are they to survive? Um, and you know, the kid has a really long life expectancy <laughs> and, uh, <gasps> that's right. A long and fulfilling life. I think basically that's right from the outset of the film. It um, lets you know exactly what kind of movie it is uh, with these freeze frame character introductions, um, which, you know, they're just such a cool idea to, to do that. And as you say, each character has their own life expectancy written uh, written in the freeze frame, which, you know, it's just a great idea to do. And it's so, it's so cool and different. Um, but it, yeah, it, it lets you know immediately what it is, and it doesn't try ever to pretend to be anything else. Um, but yeah, that, that's what I loved about it as well. It doesn't take itself too seriously, um, and it's it's just doing again what I'm really trying to do is just to make something really fun that people you know will enjoy watching, like a, a popcorn movie, you know. Yeah, I, I, I particularly you know I think this was the result of the the green light project because Ben Affleck. And Matt Damon, our producers. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, let's make sure I've actually got all the. Um, make sure, yeah, you've got, I and mean, there's somebody else as well. Wes Craven was actually a producer on that as well. Say again. Wes Craven was a yes, producer. Yes, Cra the... Thank you. That's who I was thinking of. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, so Ben Affleck, Wes Craven, and Matt Damon uh, are yeah. all the executive producers uh, of it, um, and the Maloof family. Adrian, Colleen, Gavin, George, Joe, Phil. <laughs> they're all part of it, you know, they're all producers on it, uh, on it as well. Um, it's just fun if you haven't seen it. I think, do you have a favorite moment or a favorite kill? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> and, they, you know, they really don't let up on the blood and gore every time. That, uh, there's an attack from the, the monsters that is just you know almost elevated each one it just gets worse and worse and more horrific and and disturbing um but yeah the the uh the again bit of a spoiler but the uh the hapless beer delivery guy who um who gets infected from from the, the bile that's spit from one of the monsters quite early on and slowly his face is decaying throughout the film and uh, and to, you know you just feel so sorry for him because no one cares about about the character at all. No one cares about him. And then right at the end, he, he just gets this absolutely fantastic kill from one of the uh, the Papa monsters. Um, and the the blood uh, effect, the gore effect, is just absolutely brilliant. Just an explosion of of blood and gore. Um, so that I, I guess very difficult to choose, but that was that was a great kill. Yeah, and I, I, I like that you have such a, because basically it's a whole load of people tra um, trapped in this diner um, with all the things um, attacking from outside and then inside and, and so on. And it's nice because I think people actually act sensibly rather than stupidly. There's nobody, you know, people get into danger because they're trying to, not be in danger yeah. they're all trying to do something you know they're not behaving stupidly to get into danger they're actually fa behaving fairly intelligently and they're still ending up in you know they are just really in a bad bad situation right. sort of thing. but it's just played to the ultimate for you know for laughs right. um the characters are well drawn um one or two of them are you know a few of them are i love the fact that as i say it was just really weird for me watching clue gallagher playing a cowboy with an earring um, <laughs> <laughs> because he's in the virginian for god's sake um which is you know, what i think of as clue gallagher um so 
yeah, it, it, and it's fun. I'm sure think what else is there? There's the, um, in terms of, of the kills. Yeah, and, and again, it's interesting. We'll possibly talk about the, there's some interesting moral dilemmas in there as well. Yeah. Um, there are, it, it's laughs, it's fun, it's fun, fun, fun. But there are a couple of really quite dark moments where I think, oh, oh, actually, oh no, that's that's yeah. you know that's difficult. That's actually um, quite difficult. What you know, what would I have done in that situation? Right. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> feast is just. Fun. I have to say, it's got one of the best endings. Um, not because of the shock ending that comes during the uh, the credits. Yes. Because that's kind of inevitable and that, yeah. you, that you know, one kind of expects that. But it's actually, you know, what is basically the equivalent of riding off into the sunset in Westerns, <laughs> uh, they take the piss out of that as well. Exactly, yeah. And, and, and it's really, really nicely done. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, just really, really nice thing. Uh, and it, I kind of want to go and see the rest of the um, the, the other two. Yeah, you uh, definitely should. The, the second one is, is good fun too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, look, it looks really good fun. Okay, well, that leads me on to my next question, which has come in uh, from Kim. Um, thanks, Kim. Keith, what is your favorite creature film? Uh, right, well, favorite movie, hands down, is John Carpenter's The Thing. Like, 100%, no no doubt in my mind about that. Uh, I would say that's a creature movie as well, although the creature changes in every scene uh, that it's in. But yeah, for sure, that is it. I absolutely love that movie. Um, obviously, you know, very, very popular choice because of the practical elements, but obviously the, the acting, the, the story, the, um, the isolation, it's just... You know, flawless, I think, uh, for a horror, um, for sure. Uh, but as I, as I said earlier, growing up um, and, and watching these movies in the late 80s and, and early 90s, it's also watching, you know, Aliens and Predator and, and movies like that as well. So, you know, I love, I love sci-fi movies too. Um, Aliens, again, that's right up there at the top because, uh, again, um, flawless movie as far as I'm concerned. Uh, creatures look great uh, in that too. Uh, I love Pinhead because it's just such an amazing creature, the way that it's sculpted and you know, it's just the, the work, again, I can see has gone into these. I just think that they look amazing. But um, yeah, basically, you know, creature movies I love. I'm trying to pick one uh, under the thing. The thing is definitely up there if, if you'll accept that as an answer. Uh, but there's so many, so many good uh, creature movies. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, you were just reminding me of conversation. I think I mentioned it on the show um, uh, recently, um, was talking to Jeff Portis, um, who obviously created uh, the pinhead uh, makeup uh, from Clive's design, um, and working. It, it is all the details, and it's the fact the scars. If you look at him on the front, there's this beautiful scar here. But then Jeff said, you know, you had to work out how you can get the meeting. At the, you know, he spent ages trying to work out exactly on a three-dimensional face how you can get the scars on Pinhead to all line up so that it looks good from the side, yeah. three quarters from the front. I don't think you ever see Pinhead from the back. Not, maybe not in a full shot, I don't think. No. Certainly uh, not in Hell. I mean, you see Chatterer because when he first comes in, you see the back of Chatterer. Yeah. But you don't, you know, and, and many times, you know, it's not often... Come to think of it, it's not very often that you'll see the back of creatures. Sure. Because that's where all the seams are. And that's where, you know, you've probably got gaffer tape holding it together or something. Um, because no, that's a great point with the the, the sculpting. Um, when I when I started sculpting the creature mask, um, you're right that, that doing something three-dimensional is, is completely different to drawing, you know, a picture that looks great from the front or looks great from the side. Um, so uh, in one of the rewards, there's it's going to be included all of the, uh, the photographs that I took at kind of every stage of the sculpting, and I think it, it kind of demonstrates that that oh that looks great from the front, and you turn it to the side, and it's it, you know it looks awful. So it, you're constantly uh, rotating the sculpture to make sure that from every angle it, it looks you know equally as, as good and, and realistic, I guess. 
Um, but yeah, very, very difficult. And um, I don't think that you know you, you kind of factor that in when you get started with something like that. It's it's, it's definitely a, definitely an art to it for, yeah. for having something that looks good all the way around. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's um, it, it, yeah, it's a skill I certainly don't have. Um, okay. Cool. All right. So if you haven't seen Feast, we heartily recommend uh, you go and see Feast. And the uh, your next choice was Train to Busan. Now, I saw this a couple of years at Fright Fest. When did you see Train? How did you come across Train to Busan? I was at Fright Fest with you, I think, when that was on. Uh, right. We were too busy drinking in the bar and, and ended, up, <laughs> ended up missing the movie. Uh, but I heard great things about it um, at its uh, uh, it's showing in, in Fright Fest. So I, I looked it up um, basically when, when we got back uh, and got the DVD. So um, yeah, I heard, heard great things about it and I do like um, a lot of foreign language horror as well. So um, And a lot of good movies that have come out of Korea in, um, in recent years uh, from South Korea. So you know, it was very interesting to, to have a look at it for sure. What, what's your, um, what's your favourite part about the film? Oof. I mean, I, I think when I watched it, I, I wasn't very particularly impressed with World War Z, the you know the Brad Pitt movie, as as a zombie movie. Anyway, I you know it, it kind of obviously focused a lot more. I, I know the, the book does the same, but uh, there's not a huge amount of focus on the zombies. And I think that uh, Train to Busan did what uh, World War Z did, but in some respects to the zombies, they actually did it better. Um, because it was a lot, a lot more confined in the spaces that they had and whatnot as well. But the, the, the sort of frantic, rampaging zombies crashing through doors and, and things like that just, I think, look amazing. Um, so I, I love that that element, that panic element to it when everybody's running away and uh, there's just this you know endless horde of zombies you know clambering over the top of each other trying to trying to catch people. You know, I, I love that that element, which um, you know they've done in Twenty Eight Days Later and. And movies like that very well too. It, I, I mean, the things I really like about it are worst dad in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, your lead actor, you know, your lead character is the worst dad in the world, um, and but it's his story. It, you know, the whole story arc is his story of redemption, yes. um, of his relationship with his daughter. Um, one of the things I particularly like is the opening sequence because it's the only time that you see, I have ever seen a zombie deer in a movie. Yes, that's right. It's, re <laughs> it's, re it's a great way of opening, you know, it's like, because when I, all I knew about it, it was Train to Busan. Um, cause I try and read as little as possible about films before I go and see them. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was the closing of film at Fright Fest. So it was the only film that they were screening, uh, at the end. So I thought, oh, well, well this is going to be really, really good. I'm not going to worry about finding out too much about it before I watch it. And I just thought, okay, this is a really cool way of explaining to people that there is something wrong because you've got a, a deer that is a zombie. Yeah. Um, and you think, oh yeah, that's why, yeah, okay, boy, that's all going on. And now we've got this character who's, he's a fund manager. He's described as a fund manager. Um, and he's just rubbish as a fund. He really is just <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> but again, it's that, you know, and then during the tra during the train journey, because um, basically it's trained to Busan because he's promised to take his daughter to see it to to his ex wife when the whole thing starts off, and basically it's zombies on a train it, it, it is your short high key you know concept yeah, about this. Yeah. You know, it's not only it's a, it's a it's an enclosed space you can't escape because the train is moving. Therefore, all you can do is move either backwards or, you know, you can barricade yourself against the zombies, but you can't get out because yeah. the train is on its way. Um, and besides, you can't get out because all the countryside you're passing through is full of zombies. <laughs> or appear, you know, appears to be, you know, there doesn't appear to be safe places. But there's lovely moments in it. Like, you know, you've got one of my favorite moments in it is you get a, now, funnily enough, I've got some, um, 
uh, a nephew who, who's been living in Korea for the South Korea for the last two two and a half years. Uh, he's been teaching over there, and I, I can't wait for him to come back because I want to talk to him about Train to Busan, which <laughs> was the most successful film in Korea in yeah. a couple of years ago when it came out. Um, huge in in Korea and one of the things there's what a moment where the government is you know there's a government broadcast on the train to people saying just keep calm you're not going you know nothing's really seriously wrong and whilst this government thing is going on people are just holding up their phones and they're and they're checking YouTube and they're seeing all they're seeing what's actually going on um, so I thought it was really nice comment on you know the power of social media yes, yes. as opposed to government messages. Um, can you think of a do you have a particular moment in the film that you you've got as a favorite? I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of tense moments. I, I like the scene where they've they established again a bit of a spoiler. They established basically that the the zombies become completely um, kind of desensitized or switch off entirely when it's dark, when they go through a tunnel, which I, I don't think has been done before. That was a nice little touch uh, that they added. So what that means is that they can actually sneak past the zombies every time they go through a tunnel. Um, so there's a great scene they need to get from carriage A to C, but the zombies are in B. So they need to get through them whilst in the short time that they have going through the tunnel. Uh, so they resort to climbing over the, the luggage racks uh, on the top of the train. It's quite, you know, quite tense uh, as they're moving along, and, and there's a lot of them trying to do it uh, as well. And you know that their time is running out uh, before the train gets through the, the carriage. So you know, see, there's a lot of scenes kind of like that that build good tension um, as well. But uh, yeah, trying to pick a favourite one, I, I don't know. I mean, I did, I did like that, but the uh, the, the scene at the train station, the train terminal. When they get off to to see if everything's okay, and then, as I said, this huge army of of zombies suddenly uh, rains upon them is is just great, you know, great action sequence. It, yeah, and particularly what I particularly like again is the character. So you know, you have your core people who you're rooting for. You have a great baddie uh, yeah. in the you know the businessman, the really arrogant businessman who who will throw anybody under the cart if it's yeah. going to get you know him 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 saved yeah. um but also you know it's it's a lot about relationships it's a lot about family it's about a lot about love uh, etc um and th there's sorry a comment coming in from alan mcneil again if you like zombie animals check out black sheep it's gory it's gory and hilariously ridiculous i've heard of black sheep um <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's ridiculous fun, that movie. <laughs> <laughs> that is, yeah, yeah, I, 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 look, I look forward to that. Um, and what I also like about it is that because you are on a train and people thinking about their loved ones, all you see is one end of the phone call. So you're, you know, for example, when one of the characters phones their mother, you only see their reaction. You don't see the mouth, but you hear it. You can hear what's going on. And as you mentioned earlier on, I think, A, the zombies are great because um, you, of the, of the movement, the way, the, the choreography of the zombies, the way you spend, I think it takes about, two or three minutes to become a zombie from having being bitten um so and you and a couple of times you watch that entire transformation yeah. um and in the and a just for the you know to, to establish what's going on and b where you realize that people are putting themselves into harm's way because they're trying to help people who've been bitten yeah. um and it is that whole thing about illness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I, I like that, but it's just the way they move, you know, the choreography of, whereas on World War Z, you tend to just see zombies en masse moving like these flowing rivers of ants. Yeah. 
yeah, rather than the individual, you know. Um, I'm not sure that I can't. All I can remember from having watched World War Z is is the the images of watching them flowing like ants and these waves and waves and waves of zombies. But because again, you're on a train, you get you have to see them moving down the, car the corridors and so on. Um, it's 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 great. Craig tells me the Black Sheep is a 2006 New Zealand black horror comedy film. Yeah, Sheep, New Zealand. Yeah, work with what you've got, I guess. It's ridiculous. <laughs> 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 yeah, New Zealand, the country that brought, that brought us bad taste. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, it's, again, if you haven't seen um, And Train to Busan, it is a foreign language film. Uh, we watched it subtitled in this, and I know subtitles turn off a lot of people, but a lot of it is, you know, it's to do with action. And I don't find the subtitles, you know, if yeah. you're used to watching subtitled movies, um, I really recommend it. Um, yeah. it's, I think it's, it's definitely worth uh, worth mentioning, you know, about the the acting throughout, and you know, with, with all characters. Given that you've got a, a movie that's set, you know, in, a, in largely in a train carriage, the the setting doesn't ever seem to get repetitive or boring, and I think that's just testament to the the, the solid acting, you know, throughout the whole film with with the characters. Um, that you really care about the you know the vulnerable characters, and then you really hate the you know the the bad the bad characters as well. So it's, you, despite it being foreign language, you you get completely drawn into it, uh, and so it's you know quite rare that you get a zombie movie that draws you in emotionally. Um, but yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, Night of the Living Dead is the obvious. You know, I mean. It's, it's got the same sort of emotional impact as, as that. Yeah. What I also find fascinating about watching Korean films is that you really get an understanding of culture. Sure. You know, you know all, all the, the driver of the train wears a peaked cap. Right, as, as if he was playing, you know, as if he was, he was, um, you know, you, you have people on board, you, you have people on, uh, you have, um, Rather than just having one conductor for the whole train, you have you have people every few carriages to look after you and make sure, and they wear airline style uniforms. And um, you know, it's very important what you look like because that's what the company is. And so, I think you, watching it's fascinating to watch other cultures, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. and see all the, the, the thing. So um, yeah, yeah. Again, if you haven't seen uh, Train to Busan, um, and again. The actual, and that's an, and funnily enough, that's an interesting. We were talking earlier on about the thing and practical effects touched up with CGI. Yes. This is very much, you can, it clear, I don't know, but I assume that they're wearing um, contact lenses because, or you know, that somebody's become a zombie because their eyes go white. Uh, you know, cloud over and become milky. But at the same time, you see all the veins turning black going yeah, up the neck. Really. So, yeah. so it's that combination of practical stuff enhanced by CGI so you can actually see the stuff growing up, you know, growing up the neck is incredibly effective, very, very effective. Yeah. So, yeah, Train to Busan, really. I'm, I'm so glad you chose that because it was a really a nice excuse to... Um, <laughs> No, no, it's a, it's a great movie. Good, good fun. Um, but yeah, you know, and, and visceral as well. Yeah, um, yeah it's from... very tense. But it, also, again, it just takes its time. It runs around about two hours. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the first zombie you see is a zombie deer. Yeah. Then you really don't see zombies probably for about another 20 minutes or so. Sure. You know, you get to see um uh yeah, you, you, you really get to see see that. There's another lovely moment in uh Train to Busan, which I've just remembered. Again, stuff really happens off camera. So you know, he's the dad is driving his daughter to the train, uh, uh what appears oh, yeah. to be early in the morning. Um, and suddenly he has to pull the car up short as he approaches a junction because you've got fire engines going past. Uh, and it's like, you know, okay, well, that's a bit concerning, but obviously nothing to do with me because it's ha happening way over there. 
and the daughter just happens to, and she's a small daughter, she's only about six years old or six or seven years old, I think. And she sticks her hand out of the window and it looks like snow falling, but of course it isn't snow, it's ash. Just falling. And that's the only, that's the only comment you get really as to what's yeah. really happening. Uh, the extent until until you start seeing some wide shots later on, uh, and really establish exactly what's going on in, in the city is very clever. Keith says, "I agree, Keith, about the thing. Practical effects is the way to go. I love the story, and John Carpenter really knew how to draw you in with the characters." Yeah, definitely. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Cool. Well, we're at, we're just a few minutes to go to the end, so you've got you've got the Kickstarter. Assuming when you, the Kickstarter ends in on Thursday, Thursday evening, UK time, around about 10 o'clock, I think you said? Yes. Yes, on Thursday. So you have a few days to check it out, folks, and uh, see if you'd like to support it. And, and uh, let's get Keith flying. I, I love this idea. Um, <laughs> so I know it takes a while for the money to come through from Kickstarter, but when are you hoping to film? Your, your extras and, and do all the yeah, extras I mean, of filming. Essentially, just as soon as possible, uh, as soon as the, the funding clears, then that'll be it. We'll, we'll take advantage of the the long days, the good weather and, and things like that and get straight back out down to, the, down to the creek and get it finished. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, excellent. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Um, before we say goodbye, uh, I'd just like to let people know that... Um, Next week, I'm going to be chatting with Chris McInroy. Um, he's the filmmaker behind uh, We Summoned a Demon. Um, which <laughs> I love Chris's work. Um, a Bad Guy Number Two is the first of his films that I saw. <laughs> it's just hilarious. Uh, I love it. And we're going to be talking about his hidden horrors, uh, Student Bodies, and The Gate. Um, neither of films which I've seen before so I'm looking forward to seeing those uh, this week uh, I'll be setting the show up uh, in the next couple of days um, so please come join me next week in the meantime Keith thank you very much indeed for coming to join me thank you Nicholas what a, what a pleasure good good same here uh, I mean, do recommend going out to see the, if you haven't already see the feast and see train to Busan they're both brilliant in their own ways okay this has been chattering with Nicholas Vince I've been chatting with Keith Robson and uh, I will hopefully see a few of you guys next week and around about me are ways to check out the website for future shows and uh, subscribe etc etc okay 